You're listening to Fit Pro Sessions with Parallel Coaching, episode number three, part two. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman, and in today's podcast, we continue our discussion with Phil Quirk from PQ Performance. In part one, we talked about sleep, stress, and bubble gum. And in today's episode, we jump into career change and how you need more than one spoke in your wheel to avoid a bumpy road. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Neil Bergman. And I'm Hayley Bergman. Over the last 10 years, we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified, learn with simplicity, and coach clients with confidence. We're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work, and that with the right structure, support, and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. What I want to do, um, Phil, is um, is segue back to uh, a previous part of uh, about 10, 15 minutes ago when we talked about the services and how we we, we went on from there, and talking yeah. about this stress response and being in a in a, a I'm gonna I'm gonna correct me if I'm wrong. I'm gonna make an assumption that in the the last part of your RAF career might have been a stressful time as you're thinking about leaving. Um, what was yeah. it? What was it like? during that time when you were leaving the services and you made that, what was the catalyst to say, I've done six years uh, in the Marines. I'm, I'm six years in here. I'm ready to move on. What was the catalyst for that? Those early decisions of, a, of another career change. The third, the, the, is that the second, third, third major shift in, in your career? Yeah. 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 NLP master practitioner course in London. Um, I, and I know the day I, we did spiral dynamics, which is this theory of this evolutionary values that, that, that happen in both the micro level of us individuals, but all the way up to macro level of whole continents. Um, it's an, it's an absolutely mind blowing topic and you do a whole day of it on the master practitioner course. I realized that day that, that I was, I was swimming against the tide a lot of the time with the RAF. Um, and I was asking, you know, look, my brain and the way that I was thinking had changed because of the personal development stuff that I'd done. But what I hadn't realized is what had changed and why it had changed. Um, and, I, and, I, and I realized that um, the RAF was not going to change for me. Um, and either I revert back to the way I used to think and then, and then fit into the model. Um, the, the, the wonderful thing is it's what we call the Spiral Dynamics Values Level 4 systems. So a Values Level 4 system is a collective which is structured for big numbers. So governments, police, army, military. And, it, and the way to understand a Values Level 4 system according to Spiral Dynamics is anything where there's a rule book and a uniform to go with it. So there's our rule book. Um, and that could be, you know, the military, it could be the Bible, it could be the Quran, it, it could be any book, but it's a book that tells you what you need to do to get on well with the organization. Um, now to get on well in that system is very easy. You just do what it says in the book, you know, yeah. you wear your uniform correctly and you do everything that says in the book and all things being equal, you'll progressively go up a pyramid. Um, now, the problem that I had was that I probably moved on from values level four to over towards five and probably maybe even a bit of six. So values level five is entrepreneurial. It's, it's, it's where capitalism was born in values level five. So it's, it's the people that didn't want to be in the co huge collective, the huge safety of the numbers. So they started to reject that and go individually and say, actually, I want to create my own. I, I, I don't want to be live by these rules. I want to have my rules and I want to have, I want to have a different set of rules, a different set of principles. So level and five would be where almost you become right. You write your own rule book. Yeah. You, yeah. you, because, you know, capitalism was born in level five. Level four was what created our whole Western civilization. So it was the ability to build hospitals, the ability to have companies, but the people that lead those companies don't think the same as the employees, do they? So, the, no. so the so the person that you know, um, uh, you know the, the the person like Bill Gates has a company which has or did have a company which has probably tens of thousands of employees. But Bill Gates doesn't think like those employees. So those employees want to work for Microsoft because they part of an organization and a collective where they can all band together and have safety. And as long as they do what, what it says on the rules and that's fine. But Bill Gates isn't thinking like that at all, is he? So he's, he's thinking about how I can break the rules, how I can do things different, how I can disrupt the market, how I can 
not not abide by any rules, but by be by being completely different. Excuse me. So, so what had happened with me in the military is that I I'd moved into this different way of thinking without realizing it, <clears throat> and then I was fighting the system from within, um, and I had this this real sort of this eureka moment on my NLP master practitioner course when I realized that, that the system was never going to change. Um, and I ne either needed to start swimming with the current again, um, or I needed to leave. And, we'll jump ship. and what, what was the time and, frame between that, that very profound day on your uh, master uh, prac NLP course and actually taking action of, of, of making that formal in 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 written formal or actually leaving what was there a time frame there or was it was it a quick decision and a quick it, exit no it was a quick decision but it took a couple of years and there were, there were some certain factors there like the i i had just been promoted to sergeant um, and i was a fairly young sergeant while well, i've been promoted quite quickly um i i had all the security that i wanted with the raf i had the pension um i i had another 12 years of service i would have you know probably promoted once or twice mate you know to as high as what I could have gone as a non-commissioned rank. Um, I then, I then, um, I then would have probably then, you know, commissioned and become an officer. So, so there was a real predictable path. Um, I had a really young family. Um, I had a small, I had a toddler. And then a year later, um, my, my now ex-wife would get pregnant again. So we'd have a baby on the way. So I had every reason to stay. Um, and once again, that comfort breeds apathy. The, e the easiest thing would have been for me to stay in the RAF, without a doubt. The easiest thing would have been, well, why, why, why would I want to leave when I know that I've got a pension, I know that I've got job security, I've got ev everything I want here. Um, but once that seed had been sown, and, and uh, the decision was made in probably 2012, but I left 2014. It was probably about a year later when I really made the decision, and I just thought, you know what? Um, I, 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 the, the urge to move was becoming much more than the security of staying. Um, and, and once I accepted that, um, uh, and committed to it, uh, it's actually only seven clicks to leave the militaries. You know, you go into your sort of what's called your JPA account and it's seven clicks with a mouse and then you're kind of, that's you. Um, and, 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 and I, I committed to that. Now I set my time frame. I gave myself a year. So you, you can you can do your seven clicks, and then you can set when you want to leave. So so I set twelve months into the future. So I, I knew I was gone, but then I still had twelve months really to put into place all the things I needed to do to get the business to hit the ground running once I'd gone. But when when I when I left, you know, my my youngest daughter was six months old when I when I launched my first business. So this kind of like theory that, you know, th there is never a right time to do stuff, I don't think. If you're waiting for all of the planets to align and all the conditions to become perfect, um, go back to that money, love, speed analogy, you will just be sat, you know, with a business ready to go and your job on one side, um, waiting for everything to happen. It's never going to be perfect. And, and sometimes, it's, you know, you, you just got to commit, um, get out of the plane because, if you, if you know, the, you keep writing I mean, about you, you, it. yeah, if you keep yeah. writing, you, you, you're not, it's not, it's those planets aren't going to collide. They're not going to line up. No, you've got to move them. You've got to move them. And that's quite, that's kind of what I learned quickly is that, um, you, you don't wait for the conditions to be right. You create the conditions to be right. That's the key. So, so, so if you're, if, if you're kind of sat with, your, with, with, you know, sat on your hands waiting for everything to come into alignment, you know, at, <laughs> asking the universe to sort it out, you know, there's a very good likelihood that that's never going to happen. Whereas if you actually go, do you know what? I'm going to I'm going to be bold. I'm going to take big big action, um, and I, and 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 a certain to a certain extent, I'm going to add necessity and place my feet next to the fire with this. So I have I've got to make this happen. Um, and we, we 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 I know we were chatting before about success in business. Is it? many people fail because they're too bold and many people fail because they're not bold enough. And I think more people fail because they're not bold enough. Um, it's the old Icarus thing of getting too close to the sun and not even getting off the ground. Um, and I think for me, I had to just go, do you know what? I'm in, I'm in. And what, what, once, once I'd done that with Phil, my, my old business partner, it's amazing what you can create when, when you, when you have to. 
Um, if you don't have to do something, bear in mind, I, I think that two of the, we've got two invisible addictions for humans, sorry, invisible addictions, comfort and abundance. Um, I think we're comfort addicts and we're abundance addicts. Um, and and, and if, if anyone says, well, 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 can you qualify over those two statements? Well, every environment that we step into as a human, we shape the environment to fit our comfort. You know, if it's too cold, then we have to put the heating on. If it's too hot, then we cool it down. Um, there are very few people that will, will willingly step into a cold shower because they can have a hot shower. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so we, we, we jump in our car and then we immediately, you know, warm it up or switch the aircon on. So we, we, we pretty much walk around in the Western world constantly shaping the environment to fit our very, very narrow comfort parameters. Um, and then if you want to look at abundance and, you know, certainly, uh, you know, how many shoes does one person need, you know, to wear? You know, you, you, obviously you can only wear one at a time. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not guilty of this stuff. I am, but I'm, I'm aware of it as well. Um, so when, when you've got to create, when you, when you have got no other option but to create, and you're outside of comfort and you don't have abundance, you can create the conditions to return to those pretty quickly. Um, necessity is the mother of all invention, as you say, and I, and I, I absolutely believe that with business. So I think you've, you've, you've pretty much answered what my next two questions, but just to see if you can add on, on to it. Yeah. So, you know, is there any more advice you could give somebody who wants to enter the coaching world or the fitness industry? Um, or making a, a major career decision, what advice would you give based on all of your knowledge that you know, but also from your own personal experience of making the decision to leave the Marines, making the decision to leave that comfort place and abundance of uh, the RAF to, to go it alone? Yes, uh, I, can give you, I can give you a little analogy that I knew, um, uh, that I, I'd once heard from a colonel in the in the SAS, and he used to bring in he used to bring in officers, and he would say, say to these young officers, um, in very short thrift in his office, "You only need to know three things to get on in my organisation: um, correct decision, well done; um, incorrect decision, learn from it, unlucky; no decision, unacceptable." Um, and and I think that I think that you you know f for me the best advice I give people is to take action make a decision take action you will inevitably be wrong with things i've been wrong so many times I, you know i've lost count of the amount of times but but the wonderful thing is when you're wrong you learn how not to do something so you can immediately start to make another decision to start to return back to where you where you are the the no decision is still a the decision <laughs> yeah you decide and not to decide is 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 is, is is almost insanity in business because you're, you're, you, you are the rabbit that's caught in the headlights of a car and you're just doing nothing about it. Um, and I think that if you take bold decision um, and then take action um, and then, like I say, put your feet next to the fire with things. Um, uh, I, you know, as a good example, when, when I did my NLP trainers training, we had no money in the bank. Um, we, we'd actually started our business. So this is a good example. Pro Noctis in 2014 was launched to do, performance training in the oil and gas sector in Aberdeen. That was our target market. We'd set, that's what we'd planned for 12 months to do. Um, the month that I left the RAF, November 2014, the oil market was in free fall. The barrel had gone from like $115 a barrel and it was, it was rapidly going down towards 50 and it would go even further down from there. You know, the, the, the lights were getting unplugged in Aberdeen um, and we were up in Aberdeen on a course. And, you know, our, our third business partner, John, at the time was sending us, you know, these, these graphs of the, the price of Brent oil tumbling. Um, so we had a decision to make there, a, a real important decision. Do we stay with where, what we'd planned for 12 months or do we change, be flexible, be adaptable, be quick and move quickly? So when I, when I went out to Barcelona to do my NLP trainers training to allow me to be able to do practitioner, master practitioner course, we'd been having moderate success with doing like introduction to NLP courses, just like brief, you know, one day, two day courses. Um, we had no money in the bank at this point. Um, we, we had enough money to pay for me to go out and do the course and pay for my expenses while I was out there. My, at the time, my, my, uh, I would have had my wife and then two children, one of which was one years old and my business partner, John, uh, so John, 
John had another business on the side, so he was all right. But Phil, my other business partner, you know, he was still with his ex-wife, and 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 we had commitments. We had big, big commitments, um, and we had no money for salaries. Uh, but because we'd made the decision, and because we were prepared to really back it, um, you know, I was on my NLP trainers training uh, with a website with co- with a course the following month. <laughs> so so I was like. So, so th- these people that kind of do the do a course and then then they think they need twelve months consolidation before they put it into practice. Well, we had no option of that. So the next month, I was doing my first six day NLP practitioner course. You, you were already selling uh, spots. Even yes, though you on, were you were still still in the process of making it um, a reality for yourself. So one thing I well, got yeah, from that yeah. was being really adaptable and being really flexible, and that's something you know I see a, a lot on. You know, we've, we've coached through Parallel literally you know, several thousand learners and they have a very clear, fixed position in, in once they're qualified, how they see life panning out. And, you know, it's a big statement to make. I'm going to make it. They're, they're, I don't believe they're, they're adaptable enough. They're not flexible enough. And seeing that there's potential more opportunities or they, they could open themselves up to more opportunities and staying on this fixed timeline, uh, timeline rather, of events is yeah. limiting them massively. Whereas yeah, like, yeah. your story, it's very much a case of we wanted to go to Aberdeen. This was where the business plan was lying. But then through just seeing other opportunities and seeing just being flexible allowed you to kind of open up a whole new realm, realm for Pronoctus. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that was a defining point in Pronoctus because obviously from there, we, got, we won the Barclays contract and then the NLP business because we had our corporate training consultancy, which was the main focus of Pronoctus. And then we had the NLP Academy, which I obviously run, which you came to. I think both started to become functional. And then the, the more, the, as you know, the more pillars of income you can have into a single business, the more spokes you have in a wheel, the stronger the wheel is. Um, uh, if you've only got one spoke in a wheel, then that's a very, very um, delicate wheel that, could, that hits any bump in the road and it will collapse. Um, but if you can add spokes into the business, if you can add elements into the business, personal coaching for us, it was NLP training, um, uh, in-house NLP courses with clients like the RAF and the NHS, corporate training with Barclays and our other corporate clients. Suddenly you start to create a stronger wheel which can sustain you know, more potholes. Uh, and and that takes flexibility. It takes it takes a mindset as well. I think. And you know, it's, it's the old analogy with sales. You know, you sell the sizzle, not the steak. And and that, and and what do you sell as a PT? So is it do you sell do you sell your time? Do you exchange time for money? Do you exchange money for knowledge? Do you exchange experience for money? Um, what is it? What is it that that, that 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 you're selling now? If you're selling life tr- tr- transformational life experiences, which enables a person to live longer, be healthier, and experience life in a different way than they've ever experienced, that's kind of very different than offering a one-hour session, isn't it? It's very different. They're worlds apart. Than- they are worlds apart. And and unfortunately, that you know, I hope that that last minute gets to thousands of listeners. Because just the, the epiphany of what is it that I'm actually selling? I'm not selling a, a 60 minute time block. How do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. What's yeah. the result that I want the, my, my client to achieve? Yeah, yeah. And I think you arrive at that mindset with the, with the mindset, like we talked about earlier on, of, of, of coming to the realization there's no competition. There is zero competition. There, there, there is a crowded market. I understand that. There are other PTs. But like we've seen, there is, there's, in, in what I do, there's only me. There's no, no one else. There are other people doing, that are running courses that are doing similar things to me, but there is only me. And if I, if, I, if, I, if I reverse that kind of stress of worrying about what everyone else is doing and then, and then adopt this almost belief system that there is no competition because there cannot be competition because there is only what one of me yeah. what i end up doing is i end up freeing my mind to explore what i can do and the default of that is then other people start to worry and stress about what you're doing so you become their problem by adopting a mindset that you have no problems you have no competition and you, you know we we see all too often 
I don't know. It must be the same in all, all industries, um, but certainly within coaching and within fitness, there's so many personal trainers and fitness professionals are so worried about what other people are doing in their local gym or their local town or a new boot camp has started, but all of their attention or their focus and all their stress goes towards them rather than yeah. just saying, well, I'm in a category of one. I am Neil Bergman. No one else can turn up like Neil Bergman. No. I'll do what Neil Bergman does. And yeah. therefore they can, they can follow and watch what I do. But just to cut out all of that noise is, is yeah. a transformation in its own right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and if you listen to like the language that you use, you suddenly start to become empowered and confident which perpetuates and permeates into your, into your, the DNA of the way you speak to people because, because you are suddenly now this without competition entity. Um, then people gravitate towards that confidence. They, 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 can, they can intuitively say it. It's, it's everything that's not being said with language. It's the dot, dot, dot at the end of sentences. It's yeah. the infractionations between the way we use words. It's everything that, you know, you separate the words and then find the emotion behind the words. And when, when you start speaking with absolute intent and, and saying, you know, I, I am the world's best at being me, and actually my ideas are, are everything to me, and I believe in all of them, and I'm, and, and I'm going to put that belief, that confidence, that intention, that triangle behind it all, and I'm going to just throw everything behind it. And then suddenly, you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're chatting to people, you, you excite them, they get... They, get, they, they, they sit there and they go, do you know what? I believe what this guy is saying because this makes sense to me. Then, then you start to attract clients as opposed to chase clients. And as when you, when you boil everything back down to us as animals, when you're chasing stuff is nowhere near as effective as when it's chasing you. Um, and if you're looking at everyone else, then inevitably you are chasing other people. Um, if you are just 100% in your bubble of excellence, then people will start to chase you. Then you become wanted. As, they, as you know with humans, humans want what they think they can't have. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and consequently, you end up acting with, with way more integrity, being you, just being unapologetically you, and you yeah. end up attracting people you really want to work with as opposed to the, the tire kickers. And yeah, yeah. That, that's what's left for everybody else. <laughs> So yeah. what, what I yeah. love about the last couple of minutes is, um, and we've, we've talked, you've, we've kind of mentioned about NLP and your, your NLP courses and your, you've gone off and done your own training within that and master prac and trainers training and whatnot. Um, it's taken us an hour to get here, Phil. <laughs> but I know, what, yeah. is, I know. what is NLP <laughs> for uh, the listeners? <laughs> For me, it's the, it's the study of the mind. It's the, it's, and, it, and it's the study and the decodification of the mind. Um, it's, it's, it's the pursuit of modeling. It's the figuring out of what, what, is, it, what is it that excellence is. You know, and, and excellence is a normalization. It's, we, we, we refer to excellence the same as talent. Like the things that you can touch, things that, are, you know, that, that have a place in reality that are nouns. You know, Neil has real talent. You know, but talent and excellence are a process. And what I think NLP does really well is it strips down nominalizations. It strips down these kind of like, you know, abstract words and then studies. Well, what is, what is it that comprises that? What is the person that displays these behaviors of excellence? How do they think? What are their beliefs? What are their values? What are the pictures that are creating in their head? What's their internal dialogue saying? What's, what's everything that's going on between the ears and then the top three inches. Um, and if I understand that and I can make that into a process, I can replicate it. I can take that, I can take that modeling principle, I can understand how it is, how it works, and I can replicate it for myself. And then when I replicate it for myself, I, I can then show others. Um, I don't think, most people don't understand the power of their own mind. Um, only, only, depending on what book you read, it's different in different books, but between 20, um, and as low as 5% of our neural activity is consciousness, is, is the stuff that we're aware of, our thoughts and our internal dialogue. Most of it, you know, let's just say arbitrarily, there's a 90-10 split. 90% of what's going on is subconscious. We're not thinking about it, but it's still all running in the background. Um, when, when you understand that part of the brain and how powerful that is, and you get that pointing in the same, in the same direction as the conscious brain, suddenly things become 
really, really interesting for a person. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. We call the conscious brain the goal setter because you set your goals with your conscious brain. So let's use January the 1st, as I'm sure you'll know and all your listeners, uh, January is the busiest year in the gyms throughout the whole of the country and then February is the quietest, mo- sorry, January is the busiest month and then February is the quietest month. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Look at this logically. So I, 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 I go out on December 31st, I get drunk. I've, I've been eating terribly all the way through Christmas. So I'm now in a position where I feel terrible because of all the good fun I've been having in the last few weeks. So I say to myself, December 31st, my last blowout night because I've you know been drinking too much and eating too much. Um, January the 1st, new year, new me, new body, ready for the summer. Very, very predictable, yeah? So I set that with my conscious brain. I consciously go, this is my goal, is to join a gym, go three times a week, start eating healthy, and then start developing the path towards the body that I really want for when I go on holiday um, in June, July, August. But what we haven't done is recruited the unconscious brain into this. So we've got 10% of the brain is on this consciously, but but the other 90% might not be aligned with this goal at all. It's not, and, and it's actually pointing in a different direction. So, so it's like trying to, trying to sail a boat with only 10% of your sail while you've got the other 90% acting as an anchor. Um, and this is why it's so torturous. This is why the, 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 it's, it's over within two weeks because the person's relying on motivation. Motivation is an emotion. And any emotion like happiness and sadness comes and goes. And if you're only relying on motivation in your conscious brain, you will never succeed in the goals that you set yourself. Wow. Now, if you get that 90% aligned with the 10% pointing in the same direction and you point them both in the same direction, and then you replace motivation with commitment because commitment is unwavering. Um, uh, I learned this working with Ed Clancy. Ed Clancy always used to get asked whenever I was doing presentations with him, um, how do you stay motivated across three or four Olympics? And his, an- his answer was genius. I, he goes, I don't. I don't. He goes, you know, if it's raining outside, do you think I'm motivated to get on my bike and go ride for five hours when it's raining in, in January in Yorkshire? But the thing is, no matter how motivated I am or am not, I am always committed. And he turned it back on this guy and he said, are you always motivated to go to work in the morning? And the guy was like, no. But you always go, don't you? Because you? And you go because you're committed and there's no other option. You don't even entertain the idea of not going because of your commitment levels. So the motivation can come and go, but the commitment's always there. So one of the things that I've always been a passionate of is you, you remove m- motivation when they're motivated, that's great. Everyone can train when they're motivated. Everyone can go to the gym when they're motivated. It's when they're not motivated, it's the problem. Replace that with a commitment, strong commitment. The only way you get commitment is when you align the subconscious and the conscious brain pointing in the same direction. Um, every decision that you're making at an out-of-conscious awareness level is going to be still nudging you towards that goal as opposed to pulling you away from it at a subconscious level. And we hear all too often in all, all areas of life, um, i just not feeling it today. I'm just not motivated today. Or, you know, Lost we, mojo. I've been guilty of it, you know, <laughs> way too often. And I'm sure, sure you have as well. And, you know, I, le- I learners that, you know, I'm not, mo- I just don't, don't, I'm not feeling revision this week or it just didn't happen. And we come up with a, a justifiable reason or a, or a nice excuse. But the reality is we've chosen a, a word um, that only represents 10% of our brain. Yes. As opposed to committing yeah. and aligning both conscious and unconscious brain in the same direction. Yes. And I love yes. that analogy of, you know, having a sailboat up with 10% of its sails, but 90% is the anchor. Yeah. yeah. Of course, we're going to, we're holding ourselves back. Um, you mentioned about working with Ed, Ed Clancy. Is there any other, and you've talked about Barclays and one of those, other clients that you're, you can talk about in terms of how powerful this has been, whereby the app they've, they've, you've seen the result on a on a stage for example at like ed clancy with within cycling and and at the olympics um well i mean obviously there's the athletes i've worked with which has been amazing um, um from various sports a lot a lot in cycling but also rugby boxing you know there's, there's various other sports tennis as well um uh, i was really uh, i started working with a really great tennis player called liam Brody, who's who is a supremely talented athlete. He's in his mid-twenties. He's, 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 and I think 
he would freely admit this. He has never reached the potential that he, he has. He's never quite uh, got a, um, and for, for, for various reasons, which obviously are probably more for the private coaching rather than the sort of uh, public podcast. But one of the great things that, that, that I'm really proud of is that, you know, early in the year he was about to retire and, and, and I was brought in by a mutual friend to work with him. Um, and, you know, quickly we, we just had to change the state he was in then. Uh, you know, he, he was, he was, he was, you know, he was pretty much done with tennis. He'd had enough. Um, and he was ready to sort of say, Do you know what, I'm going to hang my racket up. And, 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 you know, how many sports are, are littered with wonderfully talented young athletes that just didn't, quite make it for whatever reason um, didn't have the right mindset and then and then give up and they could have gone on to greatness um, next year will be a really interesting year with Liam um, uh, his mindset is now in a completely different place after the last sort of eight or ten months physically tactically technically we, we I do a lot of work with what we call the TTPP model so technical tactical psychological physiological you know they're the four quadrants that we're looking at um, and I think all four quadrants are now starting to develop and take shape. Uh, and I think next year will be a fascinating year. Um, but, you know, you, when we talk about like change, I, I've got a great story that I'm, I'm about to do a, a Facebook live about it. So, so this, this is a true story. This, um, so not, not a famous athlete, but, 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 but probably a, you know, a more amazing tale. I don't think I've got from all the time I've been coaching. So, our, our brains, our subconscious brains, really, really bite into metaphors, stories, analogies. They, 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 they grab hold of them at a very conscious and a subconscious level. And often you can affect change by using metaphor, by using story. And you, you do that a lot with hypnosis, as you know, from when you did the course to me. So, so on last year's Master Practitioner course out in the, Bar, out in the Villa in Barcelona, I did a hypnosis demonstration um, to remove or to help a person to, 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 to lower the levels of psoriasis. So psoriasis is uh, autoimmune disease. It's made worse by stress, you know, similar to IBS, similar to eczema, when the person's stressed out. So, so the theory behind that, if you think about it logically, is if the, the brain can create the worst condition, it can also uncreate it. It can, it can solve it as well as create it. And I've always known this with hypnosis. I've worked with many, many people. But for a demonstration, um, we had a guy called Tony on the course who had severe psoriasis, of really bad at the hands. And I'm talking, you know, dried, cracked skin, uh, white cracks, bright red, um, uh, really, really bad, all the way across the top of his hands and his knuckles um, and his knees as well. So I did a demonstration of hypnosis of which he didn't need, I, and, and, and for, for people who listen to this, so it'll, 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 it'll fry their melon a little bit, but I used a metaphor around a tomato and how a tomato always knows what nutrients to take from the ground to have the most perfect skin, no matter what the environmental conditions are, whether it's hot, whether it's cold, whether it's windy or rain, it didn't matter. The tomato always maintained the skin because it knew intuitively what to do. And, I, and obviously, you know, there's a load of hypnosis that was done, but effectively, I used this story. Um, and the next day, he woke up and he came in and he goes, you know, and he couldn't remember this, by the way, because it was under hypnosis. So you kind of have that amnesia effect with the hypnosis. So he couldn't remember the story. He just remembered, you know, little traces and bits. And he came in next morning and he said, oh, my hands feel a lot better today. And obviously, everyone else who'd watched the demonstration was kind of, um, smiling wryly, but not saying anything. I'd said to everyone, don't say anything because I don't want it to affect the results. I don't want you to tell him what the hypnosis was. And then it got better day after day for the whole course to the point after three or four days where it was pretty much gone. So his psoriasis was completely oh, wow. gone. And, uh, and you know, the, the skin had re returned to effectively just a very light pink to be honest with you. So the dryness had gone, the crackness, the, the, the skin had almost rehealed itself. Um, which is an amazing story, but this story gets even more amazing. When I did a, I did a one day introduction to kind of what I do, um, which I, which I do run around the country, you know, one day, just one day introduction to NLP and hypnosis. And, just and what we do feel is we put the link of those one days yes. in the show notes for this, so people can go and find out more. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and, and, 
at these one days it's just a snapshot it's an introduction um and i was telling we were i was doing some q a around hypnosis and then people were asking you well you know can you give me some examples of when hypnosis works? and i gave them an example of tony because tony wrote a review on my facebook page he's happy to talk about it but there's been there's been many many other examples like tony now one of the women in the in the in the in the audience a lovely woman called amanda who's now done training with me she put her hand up and said, well, how did it work, this hypnosis? Because I have severe psoriasis, really, really bad. Um, and she'd had it for like 15 years, 20 years. Um, now, I didn't use any hypnosis with that. With, with, sorry, Amanda. Sorry, Amanda, it was. Um, I didn't use any hypnosis with Amanda. <clears throat> I just explained to her in front of the group what I did with Tony. And then when she came on the course, which was three weeks ago, um, which was around about two months after we did this one day introduction. She came on the first day and said, after the course, my psoriasis got better, even though, you know, you just told me the story. And she wow. goes, I, 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 I can't figure out how it is because I just kept thinking about the story. Um, but, but it got better and better to the point now where her hands were better. So I use no hypnosis. Now, this is the power of the subconscious brain, the kind of bit that runs beneath the surface away from awareness. When you can affect change in that part of the brain, that some of the change can be profound. Um, and I think for, if I was a PT, you know, in the year 2019, given, you know, the number of PTs that are on the marketplace, my pursuit would be, how do I understand what's going on between the ears? How do I really be able to affect change? Because then you go, when we were talking before about what are you doing? Are you selling your one hour for money? Are you selling an experience? Are you selling knowledge? You go from this person, you know, that can not, not only help a person eat better, you know, move better, do exercises, but then suddenly you start to help them with what they're thinking. Now, the thinking part, is the bit that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The, the brain's constantly thinking, the brain's constantly in use. If you can create change in there, then suddenly what you become then is not just someone that can provide um, you know, a really great uh, uh, workout plan and a, and, a, and a really great you know, dietary advice and all great you know, bits of advice for these people, which is absolutely valid still. You, if they've got psoriasis or if they've got, you know, uh, they've got, Irritable bowel syndrome. So IBS is one other thing that's that's, that's accentuated under stress. Um, if they've got like high stress job, um, and then you can help them by the coaching that you do, eat better, work out better, but then also get their head in the right place. And how do you learn, qualify, and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching. And that's the thing, you know, stereotypically, and I think historically fitness professionals you know we work or have worked per hour basis and so we only see a client maybe one hour a week now now my biggest message of a drum i've been beaten with parallel for the for pretty much since 2012 has been what does your client do for the other 167 hours yes you, know, you can you can go off and do a an olympic lifting course you can go and do a variety of other cpd training and learn and you know don't get me wrong that does further progress you but actually how how do I help my client? How do I guide my client so that I'm able to create or elicit change for the full 168 hours? And as you say, it's the top three inches up here. So can anybody use NLP? It's, it's you know, I've, I've, I've been on, I've gone and done your, um, your practitioner course and the, the hypnosis part, you know, it was, it changed my life personally, you know, yeah. even though since, uh, you know, we've implemented parts of what we do in, inside Parallel. Um, but how can, can anybody just pick something up around NLP and start learning around language and, and, and the, the way they're using and creating that with their clients? Yes, absolutely. It goes back to what we were saying before about NLP, demystifying excellence. Um, I, I, there, there was a period, you know, not not that long ago, maybe eight or ten years, where I didn't know anything about this. You know, I'd never done been on one of these courses, um, and and then I've taken that now, where you know I've worked with multiple Olympic champions. I've been lucky enough to coach business leaders, polar explorers. You know, if I I would never have known back when I started some of the things that I've been able to do since then. But my journey, you know, is the same as everyone else's journey that, that undertakes this. All you need to do is have 
a real belief that, that what you're doing is, is good, a real thirst and a real desire to learn and develop. Um, uh, I, 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 one of the things I say when I teach my students, as you remember from the course, is I tell people to learn like a child, not like an adult. Adults make terrible learners because they can't do something the first time. They don't want to do it then because they've been conditioned to know that to think that failure is something that's wrong. That's, but if you watch a thing, child, yeah. if you watch a child learn to walk. You know, it never gives up. You know, it falls down, but it keeps getting up. And children, up until the point where they've been conditioned out of it, will just persevere and persevere and persevere until they can do something. Um, I, 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 I think everything that I do now. Is, is stuff that people can learn. Even, I mean, I'm just writing at the minute a, a seven day or six or seven day advanced hypnosis course where I'm gonna, just gonna teach everything that I do on the six or seven days. It's just all, all day, every day. It's just all about hypnosis. Um, no scripts, it's just about how you do the techniques, how you, how you get the person to the right depth, all the different inductions you can do, all the different things that you can do within hypnosis. Um, all of the ways you can teach people under hypnosis, as you've experienced before, where I, you know, I, with the with the with the class, I hypnotise the whole class together, and then just carry on teaching, um, while people are under hypnosis. Um, so, so all of that is is learnable, um, um, and 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 in some respects, with with the guys that are perhaps watching uh, this podcast that are within the parallel community. I come from that same community of being a physical trainer in the RF for PTI. Um, and, it, and I just progressed it from there. Um, you go back to you, the, the example you used before was really interesting about, um, about doing the sort of advanced strength and conditioning courses and it all being obviously very valuable. When I was an ATI, all of these guys that were doing, you know, incredible qualifications, like the very highest mountaineering qualifications, um, the only problem with that was it, it did progress them individually absolutely through the roof. You know, their, 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 their understanding of, you know, how to go ice climbing in Scotland was phenomenal. But the only problem with that is that, that most of the people that were in the RAF couldn't even get on the climbs that they were doing. So they were doing the basic stuff. <laughs> So, so my or, qualification... Or equally, there's probably lots of people that have the same qualification in which yeah. case they, they can't be separated or you know they're not unique <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. You, you kind of become you, you become sort of beige on white don't you mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah completely i mean that, that, that's a key point as well you know i actually first met you what back 2012 2013 you know as you yes. were coming um on that transition out of the raf into kind of civvy street and although you had your pti and your qualifications within the raf you were requalifying as a PT and level four specialist. And that's where we first, first met. Yes. So, you know, to kind yeah. of provide that evidence of somebody that's gone through a number of career changes, but actually the roots of it thought that fitness was the, the first avenue to, to pursue. Um, yeah. And, and look what you've gone on to do now is, is specialize and niche down within the, the top three inches of the body. Yeah. 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 And, and actually, and you, you, this is really, it's fascinating you mention this because I'd totally forgotten, not, not that I did that course, that course that I was on with you came just before I went on my NLP master practitioner. So I'd done my practitioner, but I hadn't done master practitioner. And then obviously I went on the master practitioner course and, and I never actually finished off that training there that I, that I did because obviously it was with an old company that you worked with. Um, because once I'd done the NLP course, I was kind of like, that's where I'm going there. Um, great, and yeah. And it's the, old, it's the old analogy in it when everyone else is zig and zag. <laughs> and, yeah. and the moment I'd done that, I was kind of like, this, for me, the, the mindset side of things was, was much more universal in its application. So, so for me, I coach uh, Olympic champions, like, like you know, I coach world champions, I coach businessmen, I coach people that are studying for their exams, I coach people that are, um, that struggle with getting nerves before they do a job interview. Um, and then I do group teaching and training. So the, the kind of universality of what I, what I can offer is applicable to like so many different people from so many different backgrounds. Um, and that to me was what I first realized when, you know, all that, all that back in 2012, I thought, well, if I'm a PT, 
I'm only really going to be able to apply, I'm only really, really appeal, sorry, to people that are coming to look to do, get fitter or, or, exactly. or lose weight exactly. or get stronger. Um, but if, if I do this, if I go in this direction and really take this to its farthest extremity, then my spectrum of clients is actually pretty limitless. Yeah, completely. Um, with that, I want to just t- turn our attention to, as I'm, I'm scrolling down through some notes here, and I asked yep. the, the parallel community, and we've mentioned them a couple of times in the last minute, um, if I had yep. any questions for you. So um, I don't want to spend uh, a great deal of time. I've got, I got three, three learner questions, and I really appreciate okay. your time. And then I've got two more questions for, for you, Phil. Yep. Um, so the first question from Darren, I think we've touched on this al- already. So don't, don't spend, a, a, you know, do it justice, but don't spend a too, too long on it. But what benefits does NLP produce? So Darren's recently qualified with us, actually, up in Milton Keynes back in July. He graduated as a level three PT. Um, he's currently still in, uh, in, his, in, in, his, in a full-time employment and he's looking and, and wanting to kind of put together a package for clients. So he's mentioned a number of times about NLP or the mindset um, and I've pointed him in certain ways to go and read certain books and whatnot. But he specifically asked, what benefits does NLP produce? The, uh, as always, the question like this, context is very important. So, mm. so is, it, is it produced for him individually? Is I think it, is um, it produced for, I'd, for I'd imagine for his clients. Okay, so, so uh, lots of the things that his clients will do will be unconscious behaviors that they see the evidence of in their behavior, but they don't understand where the behavior comes from and they don't understand how to change it. Um, and being able to um, understand, ask questions that reveal what's really going on, like we, we talked about before, but then know what to do at the back of that. So for instance, um, as you know from, from, from your training, the practitioner course, um, I teach people a technique where you can remove a phobia in, in, in 10 or 15 minutes. It, ta- it takes next to no time. Um, and I've, I've, I've done it with, uh, I, 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 always, I always say like over 100, but I've been saying over 100 for a long time, maybe 100, 150 people that, that I've worked with where I've helped them uh, get over their phobia in 10 or 15 minutes and then the phobia is gone. Now, for some people, that phobia might be debilitating. You know, it might be a phobia so intense that it really inhibits their day-to-day life. Um, and I've worked with phobias from all sorts of different, you know, things, spiders, moths, you know, the traditional ones, all the way up to jelly, cotton wool. Um, I, I had a client actually, since I did your practitioner course, and I had a client that had a, a, a phobia of um, sweat on their skin. Yeah. And yeah. so every time we got to any level of intensity, obviously, physiologically, the body's going to start sweating. And I always wondered why um, this, this guy would, would pull back and, and wouldn't, work i knew they had more more potential in them i knew there was way more that they could move far they could move quicker they could they could lift more and and just through a series of questions we figured out that actually there was a phobia of sweat on the skin Mm -hmm. and you remove the phobia and again like i don't think it was a a 10 15 minute it was a little bit longer than that um yeah being new to it but it was a learnable process and i just followed the the script yes uh, we went back in and it, it 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 changed the game <laughs> yeah transformational transformational so so in terms of like for the the guy that asked the question you know and, that, and that's just one example of one of the techniques we, we, we explore as you know if you've got that ability to you know you know it might be something that's got nothing to do with training you know the, I, one of the phobias i've worked with a lot is the phobia of being sick needles um flying is obviously a common one there, there's so many you know and and phobias can be debilitating if you've got that ability to do that change, then going back to that sort of there is, there is only there's there is no competition in business. There is only yourself, and it's how far you know how much you can do and what you can do with yeah. your. And I think your NLP, NLP gives you that toolbox of um, practical skills, practical um, approaches that you can implement that are just a couple of minutes long, ten minutes long, fifteen minutes long, but the impact that that produces yes. is phenomenal and i think for me that's what nlp has done it's, it says allow me to go well the client has said this i now have lots of different tools and i can pull out through nlp yes. to apply yes. to that yes yeah and 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 that and that that then creates your rave and you know fans mm. because your clients become your marketing because you know it's they come to get physically fit and um, 
But then what, you know, one of the, one of the things that I'm a huge fan of in hypnosis is called a, something called a psychological de- detox. Um, and that's, that's the, that's the first part of some of the hypnosis. I, I pretty much, I always do now with my clients. I do a, or, or a mental detox. We do a mental detox. So, you know, you, you put them into the hypnotic state and you get them into the right level. And then all of the stuff that's been bothering them, all the stuff that's been, you know, the images, the feelings, the memories that have been affecting them and holding them back, you allow them to let go of those things. You know, one second, there's a door. We, we'll have to, should we pause? Should we yeah, pause? No, you, you go off, you go off. It's, it'll stay recording. Come in, mate. Come in. You have to be quiet, Smudge. I'm doing a put- yeah. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the other thing that I, I did as well, Phil, was... Uh, I, had, I also had a client uh, quite shortly after the, the, the practitioner course that yep. had a, to cut the long story short, he had a sweet drawer for his kids <laughs> at home yeah, yeah, yeah. and would, you know, through boredom and a number of things going through a tricky part we're in a relationship as well. He'd find himself always going back to the, the drawer. So I just did a, a like to dislike on opening the drawer, which is yeah, one of the yeah. a like to dislike is one of the, for the listeners is a, is a, a um, NLP Technique. Um, technique and uh literally there uh, thereafter he was opening up the drawer and he was he, he's just like I, I don't like it i don't like touching it and he he, he couldn't yeah. and within that you know the, the the amount of calories he was consuming on a day-to-day or week-to-week radically declined and suddenly we start to see a calorie deficit and and the the byproduct of that as well is you know and uh, and i you, you know the way that i teach i teach things i demystify things and i teach things um, you know, I, I explain the science, I explain how it works, you know, but there, there is a, there is a certain element of mystique that comes with that, where you become this person that, 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 that helped them get over a phobia by doing some visualization and the phobia just you know, kind of disappears. You become this person that where they've got this thing about the sweet drawer that they can't stay out of it. And now they, now they can't open it because when they do, they just feel a little bit weird and nauseous and then it pulls them away. You know, when, when they're talking to their, you know, their, their friends and when they're having exactly, a dinner party. Yeah. They go down the pub you, and they say, this happened. <laughs> yes. It's a weird yes. conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and once again, you become this competition of one theory. You become this person that can do things that other PTs just, just don't have the knowledge or the understanding or the capability to be able to do. Um, and then that you, that's a, that's a, performance differentiator then isn't it it's it's yeah. you know so when people are looking to hire a pt and they and they hear about neil bergman who 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 actually can do hypnosis and help with weight loss under hypnosis uh, can actually remove some unconscious programs which are really unhelpful can help people with their confidence can help people with a phobia suddenly you become this kind of category you know, of one a very different category of one isn't it yeah. um so on, I want to jump on to the next question because I, pre- I really appreciate your time. Um, and, and I'm going to give you a 60 second um, timer on to answer this one. Because I, again, I just feel we could just talk yeah, yeah. for hours yeah. on this next question. But Lisa asks, what kind of behavior change works for people that are making nutritional changes? And how do you make it stick to their lifestyle rather than the, the three months? And I think, you know, we've touched on this already for those people starting in January, the new year, new you crowd. And then in, in, in February, they're, they're no, no longer there. But is there, in 60 seconds, can you give Lisa something, a, a practical tip or a bit of advice or something that she could go away that could, could implement today and say, I, if, I, if she did this with a client, then the likelihood of, of their client creating a behavioral nutritional change goes up. Yeah, um, all of the advice that you'll be given is in that ten percent of conscious. So that's what that's where people will operate now. Conversationally, you know, when you're talking to your client, you, you're talking to that ten percent, um, and the person with that ten percent can make changes and 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 stick to them for a certain amount of time before they stop thinking about it consciously, and then the subconscious takes over. If you get that ninety percent, if you affect change in there. 90% always beats 10%. 10% never beats 90%. So, so it's learning how to really understand what's going on at an unconscious level, the programs, the habits, the behaviors, the origins, how to undo them, and then create new programs, more positive behaviors that run away from their conscious awareness. I couldn't teach that in 60 seconds. Over, no, no, it's, it's a good effort. <laughs> 
So final question then, Phil, and I just want to acknowledge your time today and say thank you. Um, also your energy, your effort, your approach to coaching. And, you know, since I've known you since what, 2012, 2013, what you've done for, for yourself, for your family, for your industry, for the industry you work in, you know, I just want to acknowledge that and that first for learning to continue to grow. So with all that in mind, what I want to do is ask one final question. I'm going to ask every guest that comes on to fit pro sessions, this same question. What's okay. your, de what's your definition of an outstanding coach? Wow. <laughs> Uh, the definition, um, an, an outstanding coach is the person that can empower and enable all of their clients to surpass any of their perceived goals and limitations. There we go. Thank you very much, sir. So, um, I want to end, end, end the podcast there. So, uh, I just Brilliant. want to say a massive, uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, for joining us today and um, hopefully we'll have you again on, a, on another sh uh, show soon absolutely thanks for having me it's been great superb hi i'm neil bergman and i'm Haley bergman over the last 10 years we've helped thousands of fitness professionals to get qualified learn with simplicity and coach clients with confidence we're the first to say that learning and being a fit pro doesn't have to be hard work and that with the right structure, support and resources, you can become a confident and knowledgeable fitness professional that is dedicated to more. So how do you learn, qualify and kickstart as a fit pro? This is the Fit Pro Sessions podcast with Parallel Coaching.